Michael, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's great to do one of these in person again. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your report um, and some of the analysis that went into it. What, in your view, what does this market encompass in terms of indications mm -hmm. and size and why now? Why are we uh, looking at this, this market again? All right, yeah, so I, I guess to start off our report, we basically went through a thorough look at all of the data that's been produced over the past 10 years in the real resurgence of the space and then going back to the 60s and 70s when the space initially emerged. And the, the markets here are huge. These are broad mental health indications and I think it makes sense to kind of take a look at four of the most relevant ones. Depression, anxiety, PTSD, and then substance abuse. So for depression, right, this is a huge category. There's 21 million patients, and about 60% of those are actively seeking treatment. When you look at the treatment market, it's mostly categorized by um, your SSRIs, um, SNRIs, atypical antidepressants, and those have regularly reached sales approaching two to three billion dollars. The SSRI class is actually probably the, the most prolific and most typical of the antidepressants. And when those first came onto the market, that's what drove the class to its peak in 2003 of 15 billion in annual sales. When you look at anxiety, this is actually a larger category but encompasses a number of related indications ranging from generalized anxiety, which is what you would typically think of. It includes OCD, phobias, and PTSD as well. So with anxiety disorders, you're talking about 19% of the U.S. population facing some form of anxiety disorder, and 50% of those reporting that they have a moderate or severe impairment due to their disorder. Um, so if we look at those markets, right, because they're usually grouped together, depression and anxiety, since the treatments have a lot of crossover, that market is generally thought to be worth around $18 billion at the current date. If we look at substance abuse, um, this is actually a massive category just to the, due to the significant impairment. You're talking about around 8% of the U.S. population has some sort of substance abuse problem. And looking at the rehabilitation and treatment market alone, that's a $42 billion a year industry. So these are huge markets that you're talking about when you're looking at psychedelic medicine. And there's a significant unmet need in that market for new treatments. So let's talk a little bit about COVID, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and some of the, um, the trends related to this market and how COVID has affected it, right? So now, you know, if we look at some of the increases in, is in an already large market, um, something like COVID has really um, exasperated it, right? So tell me a little bit about that. How have the numbers increased mm -hmm. just in the last couple of years? And are we going through a mental health epidemic? So yeah, that's a, that is a great question because without a doubt, COVID has exacerbated an underlying mental health crisis facing not just this country, but the whole world. And the numbers are not the easiest to quantify, but uh, if you look at rates of people reporting depressive symptoms, that increased threefold over the first year of the pandemic. Now, I think a more robust data point, though, comes from a recent report from the WHO reporting a 28% increase in rates of major depressive disorder and a 26% increase in rates of um, anxiety disorders. Now, if we look at substance abuse, that's another area that was greatly affected by the pandemic. And I think the best hard end point to look at there would be the number of overdose deaths, because that really gets the crux of the crisis. And overdose deaths increased approximately 29% within the first year of the pandemic, reaching more than 100,000 on a trailing 12-month basis. And that has been sustained into early 2022. So I think whether or not these changes to our mental health landscape are going to be durable, that remains to be seen. But the most important thing is that this has highlighted the underlying mental health crisis facing the world today and the need for new treatments. So it looks like we're at a perfect juxtaposition really between mm. a huge market, an increase in the market, increase in the market need in combination with the research 
that's coming to the forefront in the clinical trials. So we have already st had the first drug approval with yeah. ketamine. So the market has already started, essentially. And that drug is owned by Johnson & Johnson now, so it's in within the pharmaceutical sector already. And we have, um, it looks like an emergence of other clinical trials that are down around the corners. Can you talk a little bit about what clinical trials are currently out there? How many companies are pursuing mm -hmm. this market right now? Yeah, so the, the psychedelic medicine space is actually relatively large in terms of the number of companies. You have approximately 50 public companies developing psychedelic drugs, and nine of those are listed on U.S. national exchanges such as the NASDAQ or NYSE. And in terms of clinical trials, right now recruiting, there are approximately 50 across um, four of the most developed psychedelic drugs, such as um, depression, there's a bit over 30, or not depression, sorry, psilocybin, there's a bit over 30, um, followed by MDMA and then LSD and DMT. Great, thank you. So what, in your view, why do you think that there's a, a huge resurgence in this market? And why should we be looking at mm -hmm. this market as investors now? Well, so I think you touched on one of the most important events for the space, and that was the approval of J&J's Spravato. Whether or not you consider ketamine to be a true psychedelic, is a, it, it's a bit of a controversial topic because it is a dissociative, it's not a classical hallucinogen or an intactogen. However, at, at the core, it follows a very similar treatment mechanism and a very similar treatment um, protocol that you would see with psychedelics. These are drugs where you have a perceptual experience associated with the drug effect, and you're placed in a facility for the duration of the treatment. So I think that kind of opened up a lot of this um, research from the 50s and 60s. And I think to understand why it's resurging, you have to kind of understand some of the cultural context of why it went away. Because the research back then was not from you know hippies and in the counterculture movement. These were serious academics. However, it did get tied up with that in the war on drugs. And that kind of put out the fire under the, under the research. So where we are today is, like night and day. The data is better than it has ever been. The trials being conducted are not the academic trials essentially trying to figure out how to use these drugs. These are robust, randomized, controlled, placebo-controlled trials being developed for the purpose of FDA approval. You saw recently the largest study to date within a, um, with a classical hallucinogen from Compass Pathways. You saw data from MAPS's first phase three. And I think you're also seeing a lot of signs that regulators are taking this seriously. And I would point to the fact that psilocybin and MDMA have both received breakthrough designation. So I yes. think that's the, the big point, is that the FDA is taking this seriously, the data is there, yep. and I think it's something that's worth paying attention to.